Hi guys, welcome back to my workshop and studio here at Homestead Strings. I'm Gregory Glessner, the owner of this shop and your host for this video. This is the second video in the eight-week series called Strings, How and Who. If you haven't seen the first video on basic string vibration or want to review it, please check it out. The link is in the description. As we did last week, we will focus on forming a model in our minds about how strings work, what it means for us as players, and avoid fancy math through the whole process. In last week's lesson, we discussed how strings vibrate and create pitches, but just how a pitch sounds is a whole other matter we call tone. I talk a lot in lessons about tone. String players are always chasing a better tone, or they should be. In my shop, I fuss a lot about the tone of my instruments. When we talk about tone, we assign qualities to it, like bright, dark, harsh, muddy, etc. Rather abstract things, but just what is tone? The simple answer to what is tone is the mix of frequencies present in a sound, the shape of the waveform that those frequencies create, and how a human ear, or your teacher, senses it. You may not understand this now, and that's okay, but let's unpack what all of that means and give ourselves a way to make this more concrete in our minds, and answer the question of just what is a good tone, and how do we create it? We first need to think of sound as a wave in the air. It happens when something pushes and pulls really quickly on the air around us. We can actually visualize a sound wave by looking at a graphical illustration of a waveform. When the line moves up, that represents the sound wave pushing on the air, creating a bit of pressure called a compression. When the line moves down, it pulls on the air, creating a little vacuum called a rarefaction. These compressions and rarefactions move our eardrums so we hear sound. Whatever you are listening to me on right now is creating thousands of these little pressure vacuum or compression rarefaction waves that you hear as me speaking. Sounds we usually hear, music, speech, various noises, are made up of many, many different frequencies of sound waves happening all at once. It's like lots of different pitches working together. We never notice this because our brains are too busy assigning meaning to these mixes of frequency, and we never really hear the mix itself. Here is a demonstration of how waves can be created and combined. Let's cut over to my well-dressed twin. I draw a wave by moving my arm up and down as I move across. It looks like this. It would push and pull on the air pretty quickly. Lots of compressions and rarefactions, and we would call this a high frequency. Now, let's draw another wave. This time, I'll keep my arm pretty still, and move up and down more slowly, this time from my knees. It looks like this. Let's just fill that in there a little bit. There we go. Now, if I combine these two motions by drawing the high frequency with my arm, and the lower frequency with my knees, the wave would look like this. The higher frequency is riding the lower and would push and pull on the air like this. Now if I strapped a little doodly motor to make this pen shake as I go along, 
it would make lots of little waves, which would be like really high frequencies. Now, if somebody was behind this whiteboard moving it up and down even more slowly than this, it would be yet another frequency adding more what we call complexity to the wave. In this demo, we saw two frequencies mixing. In reality, most waves we hear have thousands of different waves mixing. Now, just a little bit ago, I mentioned the word complexity. And that is when a wave has lots of little ups and downs within the big ones. But what is a simple wave? Here's an animation of how the simplest possible wave is created. It's basically a spinning circle moving along and drawing a wave. If a speaker moves in and out with the wave's path, making compressions and rarefactions in the air with the line, we hear a pure frequency. This circle could spin faster or slower, creating waves at higher or lower frequencies, or it can be bigger or smaller, creating louder or softer waves. Pure sine waves never happen alone in nature. We can think of the sounds we hear as choirs of circles, big and small, soft or loud, and spinning fast or slow, or high and low frequencies, singing simple waves that work together to make the sounds that we know. Like these two waves did to make this one. When I play my open A string, which is under the tension that makes the Helmholtz corner, watch last week's video if you haven't already, go back and forth about 442 times per second, which is 442 hertz, which makes us hear the pitch A, there's a lot more to this sound than just the 442 hertz A vibration. There are many smaller high frequency waves riding on the lower frequency ones. Let's take a look at what the violin waveform looks like. There are a lot of little ups and downs, as well as some bigger ones. This tells us that there are many different frequencies at work, creating a complex pattern of compressions and rarefactions upon each other. Here's another way we can look at sound. This is called a spectrogram, and this one is analyzing the wave that we just looked at. The spikes you see tell us what frequencies are present and how loud they are. The horizontal, or side-to-side -side axis, is frequency. We can think of this as representing thousands of different circles spinning at higher speeds as you look to the right. We can think about this another way. In the whiteboard demo from my well-dressed twin, the lower frequencies on the left were like his knees moving more slowly. The really high ones on the right would be like a doodly motor on his pen moving really, really fast. And the middle ones would be like his arm moving in between them. The vertical, or up and down axis, is amplitude, or loudness. We can think of this as representing the size of the circles, or how much each part of my twin moved as he drew the wave on the board. For example, his arm could have moved not as far up and down for each wave, and his knees could have moved more, and that would have made the higher frequency in his arm less, and the lower frequency from his knees more. When a certain frequency is louder, it creates a visible spike in the graph. 442 hertz is the pitch we hear, and that is called the fundamental frequency, which is the lowest frequency. There is a big spike there, as 442 hertz is obviously pretty loud. As you look to the right on the graph, you see more spikes, most of them pretty small, and as you go farther to the right, they mostly get smaller. These spikes are called overtones, and they are the high frequencies that give the wave lots of little ups and downs. Different instruments, different people's voices, even different noises made by machines sound different, so they would look different. Some spikes would be higher or lower than others. Some may be non-existent. For example, here is yours truly singing the pitch A. Ooh. 
This is clearly different. There is a different mix of frequencies, a different waveform, and a different tone, even with the same pitch. There are way fewer ups and downs, and on the spectrogram you can see that the spikes further to the right just really aren't there. If I generate a sound that is purely 442 hertz, here is what that sounds and looks like. This is what the spinning circle on the moving graph draws. Pretty dull by itself. Let's build a more complex sound. I'll artificially add more of the pure frequencies that would stack up in a sound coming from an instrument. This is called the harmonic series. Hey, I know this is a digression, but simply put, my lesser addressed twin is adding pure frequencies by multiples of 442. So we have 442, and then 2 times 442 equals 884, 3 times 442 equals 1326, 4 times 442 equals 1768. And you could take that math all the way out to infinity and you can do it with any frequency. I think it's really cool that any sound can be constructed out of just pure frequencies. As I add more overtones, we get closer to what the violin sound sounds and looks like. Okay, that's a lot of science on waves and sound. Let's start applying it to strings. The sound of a tone is determined by the mix of frequencies that the string and instrument generate in the air. In general, a brighter tone has more of the high overtones, and a darker tone has less of the high overtones. Certain bumps and valleys in the overtone spectrum can make an instrument feel particularly powerful or just off balance and come off sounding nasal. If we go back to the Helmholtz model of string vibration, we know that it is basically a series of slaps hitting the ends of the strings. This creates a spiky, jagged, or we could call it complex waveform far from the pure simple frequency we looked at a while ago. This gives us a lot of overtones to work with, and thus we have a lot of opportunity to make real beauty or ugliness with the sound. In a perfect Helmholtz world, the corner would be infinitely sharp and make a perfect and infinitely short slap on the bridge followed by a ramp. Here's what that would look and sound like. It's called a sawtooth wave. This would create overtones that go virtually to infinity. In reality, even digitally, we can't create this. The slap has some roundness to it, and on a violin, the instrument just can't amplify those ultra-high frequencies. Here's a direct comparison between the sawtooth wave and my violin. They do look similar, which tells me that my violin is working well, but my violin will never ever be able to hit the sawtooth wave.
The position of your bow relative to the bridge is probably the most important factor in determining how your string vibrates. If you've explored this, you may feel that you need more weight on the bow to make sound closer to the bridge, but that weight crushes the sound closer to the fingerboard. You may have also noticed that closer to the bridge, you can get more brightness than farther from the bridge. You've probably also noticed that you can make louder sounds closer to the bridge, and you can get softer sounds farther from the bridge. Why is all that? Let's take a look at a large-scale example of a string. When I hang this weight, or my bow, very close to the end of this piece of silicone, very stretchy, it actually sinks very little. When I move it closer to the center, wow, that takes a lot of willpower to move. It sinks a lot more, even if I put it under a lot more tension. This is an important aspect of an elastic thing under tension. It resists movement more at its ends than closer to the middle. Keep this principle in mind. We also need to recall the stick-slip action of the bow, where the bow grabs the string only to have it slapped away. Bowing closer to the bridge requires more bow pressure because the string needs a stronger stick in order to form a Helmholtz corner that goes rocketing to the other end. If you apply that pressure farther from the bridge, you'll get a good stick for sure. But the corner, because we can think of the string as weaker in the middle, won't have the oomph to knock it back into the slip phase. Since it takes more force to make the corner closer to the bridge, that greater force pulls a sharper corner that creates sharper waveforms closer to that of the perfect sawtooth wave and a brighter tone. If you're farther from the bridge, less force pulling the corner creates a rounder corner and that dulls the razor edge on the sawtooth wave the string creates. It's interesting that increasing bow pressure by itself doesn't really make more sound. Bow pressure is just there to engage the string in the proper Helmholtz friendly way. No more, no less. Why does playing near the bridge make a louder sound? Well, really, it doesn't as much as we want to think. Let's go to an animation we used last week. The string has to move with the bow in the stick phase, or else it's not sticking. If the bow were closer to the end of the string, the stick phase would take a shorter distance across the string. Remember, the string moves less closer to its ends. You can see that in the animation. And it would move more slowly, since the actual time in each phase is locked to the frequency of the string. Less distance across the string within the same time means a slower speed. If the bow were in the middle of the string, the stick phase would cover a long distance across the string, and the bow would have to carry the string all that distance way faster to complete the stick phase in the right time. If we want to play louder or softer, we need to change the width of the vibration in the string. Bigger vibrations make bigger sound. Since the time the bow has with the string in each stick phase is set, the bow has to move the string faster to make a wider vibration and louder sound more distance, or width of the stick phase, within the same time means faster speed. To move the string faster, the bow has to move faster too. It's not really placement. It's the speed of the bow that makes loudness. Thoroughly confused yet? You're still thinking that bowing closer to the bridge makes louder sound, right? Let's sort that out. Let's look at the animation yet again. I'm sorry if you're tired of this one. 
The release from the stick phase throws the corner off to the side, and it bellies out in the middle of the string. If you bow closer to the bridge, remember the stick point moves more slowly there, the length of bow you use per stick phase is less, therefore your bow speed is slower, and you feel like you're getting more result from less bow speed. You'll also, rightly, feel the need for more pressure to properly engage the vibration, which gives the feeling of more power. You can achieve the same width of vibration with faster bow, gotten with the string faster, farther from the end of the string. The sound will sound less because it's not as bright, and you won't have the feeling of power from applying lots of bow pressure. Here is me playing some different tones on my violin. You'll hear the sound and see the waves and spectrograms. This is farther from the bridge. And this is close to the bridge. And this is in the middle. So far, we've seen ways that we can influence the mix of overtones coming from our strings. But there's no right or wrong answer to the exact mix. I would say that I've played with good tone in all the mixes that I just made a few seconds ago, but they're all different. As we know, different great violinists all sound great, but they don't sound the same. What they all have in common, and this is one of the big challenges playing strings, is that they create Helmholtz vibrations cleanly, instantly, and sustain them without interference. When we create a good Helmholtz motion, we're exciting a lot of overtones, and that's a good thing. It gives our sound life and brightness. Under our ears, though, that sound could seem harsh and metallic. We have to remember that we sound different farther away, and that has to do with how sound travels, which we don't have time for in this video. I've linked an article down in the description. It's a good read for everybody. A word to my students, though, there will be a question or two from this article on your assignments. In short, a good tone is the sound that is musically appropriate and comes from a quickly created and freely sustained Helmholtz vibration. When the vibration doesn't fire up quickly, that makes for a tone that comes across as muddy or maybe dull. Our instruments and bows are designed to work together, so finding balance, especially in your right arm and hand, is the key to creating and sustaining a healthy Helmholtz vibration. It shouldn't be hard physical work. Whether it's loud or soft, bright or dark, hissy or pure sounding, that's for us to decide using our knowledge of string vibration. We can make narrow or wide vibrations, we can control the sharpness of the Helmholtz corner, and we know how bow pressure figures in. From there, what the sound looks like on a computer doesn't really matter. Now for the experiment. Last week, you made your neighbors think you went nuts with the experiment. This week, you're going to confirm that. Even though it wasn't a main point, we touched on three variables that affect tone and dynamic. They were bow placement, bow speed, and bow pressure. If you have an instrument with you, Try altering these variables. Create many different combinations of them using the extreme ends of each one. Get right on the bridge, get over the fingerboard, push into the string really hard, don't push at all. Move your bow really fast, move your bow really slow. Find ways to make crunches, whistles, and maybe even beautiful sounds in the process. Keep your right arm and hand totally relaxed the whole time. 
If you don't like the sound you get, rebalance your arm, which means get rid of the tension and make sure your shoulder isn't being raised, and try again. I also want you to specifically try varying pressure with the same placement and speed. Let me know what happens. Be annoying, it's fun. Every day, try to find balance. Where are you creating maximal sound with minimal effort? Excess effort just interferes with string vibration and crushes the life out of string sound. We take our sound for granted. All too often we practice without really listening to ourselves. I challenge you to think about some of the physics that we witnessed together. Listen for overtones. Watch your strings vibrate. Feel the resistance that makes a sharp Helmholtz corner that excites those fast little circles that make high frequencies. Feel how your bow glides over the string, repeatedly grabbing it and letting it go. I will actually link the program that I use to record and make the waveforms and spectrograms, and you can do the same thing yourself on pretty much any computer. So I encourage you to do that. Experiment. Figure out what your sound looks like. It's a very interesting thing to look at. The things we talk about in artistic form have deep scientific implications. We are shaping waveforms and creating mixes of frequencies that people like to hear. By knowing the science, we can think more concretely about what we physically do on our instruments to make, hopefully, desirable sounds. With everyone doing lessons remotely, teachers can't really judge your sound now. They know if you're playing in tune and in good rhythm and if your instrument is sounding well. As far as the exact details of your tone, it is up to you. This is an opportunity to develop your own ability to critically evaluate your sound and manipulate the physics behind it. If you have questions, please leave a comment below, and I will address it either with a reply, or I might even make another video on the topic. Stay healthy, thanks, and bye-bye.